Hi, everybody. I am uh, this is I am Rufus Gifford here, and thank you all so much for joining our second Out Leadership uh, this week in leadership uh, during this very unprecedented worldwide event. And the purpose of these, what we call vodcasts or webinars, is really to introduce you to. Uh, some of the leaders on the ground. Last week, we had a couple of doctors. This week, we have uh, a, a fantastic congressman who are on the really in so many ways on the front lines of, of this effort. So um, we're going to get right to it. And uh, well, let me say this first. Uh, over the course of this conversation, if you have questions, I think you'll, you should see it on the corner of your screen. Um, if you have questions that you would want, you want to ask Congressman Maloney, please do type it in and I will, uh, I will read what comes across my screen. Um, so it, it, before we get started, a few things. First, I want to thank some of our out leadership sponsors, HSBC, EY, RBC, Capital Markets, Ropes and Gray, and Green, Greenberg Traurig. Um, I like to, of course, thank all of the out leadership member firms and want to welcome our newest firms, uh, Reed Smith, Millennium, DLA, Pipe, uh, DLA Piper, Publicus Sapient, uh, and MSCI. Uh, thank you so, so much for all of you. I think a lot of you, some of you are on the on the call right now as well. So thank you so much for being here. Um, and now I have the distinct privileges privilege of introducing our special guest, uh, uh, Sean Patrick Maloney, who I think um, many folks in the LGBT community and in political circles, etc. Uh, he is a very, very familiar face. Uh, Congressman Maloney represents the 18th Congressional District in New York, which is just sort of outside the city. Um, since he was elected in November 2012, uh, he is a veteran of the Clinton administration. He is an entrepreneur. He's the first openly LGBT uh, member of Congress elected from New York. I think that's correct. Um, he lives with, lives with his his husband and three children, and they have three children. Uh, and uh, he serves on a number of committees, but it is really, uh, in my mind, a real leader um, in, in Congress these days. So we're just really delighted that he has given us a few minutes of his, what I would imagine is a remarkably busy time, uh, despite the fact that uh, we are all on home, uh, uh, work from home, including members of Congress. Um, so welcome, Congressman Maloney, Sean, thank you so, so much uh, for being with us here today. It's great to be with you, Mr. Ambassador. Always a pleasure. Thank you for the thank kind. You, thank you. Very good. Well, so let's get started. And the first thing I really want to say is, so, so uh, how how are you? Are, are you, uh, I imagine, like so many Americans, even members of Congress are, are working from home here. Um, yep. uh, how are you and your family? Uh, how are you doing? Um, and, and, and is the federal government really set up to work uh, like this? Well, thank you for asking. We are doing fine. You know, I have three kids. One is uh, out of the house living in Colorado with his girlfriend. He's doing great, um, but has been laid off uh, from his job like a lot of Americans. I've got two uh, girls at home, uh, one who's in college at John Jay in the city, but classes are suspended. So she's here doing sort of distance learning. And I have a daughter in high school who's a junior at the local uh, high school here. Um, she's home as well. You know, look, we're doing great as a family. Everybody's healthy, thank God. We have a young man staying with us who's um, normally at a at a boarding school uh, locally for uh, folks who who don't have a uh, family structure at home, uh, and he had nowhere to go, so he's he goes to school with my kids. So so he's he's kind of inside the quarantine ring, but you know we're doing okay on the professional side. You know, the fact is he's on the district level. The way we help constituents. The way we interact with people is already mostly online and on the phone. Uh, we do about a thousand cases a year out of my district office. So we're doing a lot of that work and, and that work has accelerated, especially with respect to dealing with our local hospitals, our local community health centers, um, the independent physician networks, all the people on the front lines and, and God bless them, they're doing amazing things. But also interacting with the mayors, the county executives, the town supervisors, talk to the governor a couple of times a week. Um, and then daily conference calls on the national level with the Democratic caucus planning uh, the fourth round of legislation, figuring out where the gaps are, um, even even with respect to the sweeping legislation. I'm sure we can talk about the CARES Act yeah. recently, which will really, really mean a lot to millions of Americans. You know, there's more work to do. We know that. So we can do all that stuff. I'd say Congress itself, in terms of trying to meet as a body, is still nowhere in terms of technology. I mean, we are... We are woefully ill-prepared to act as a as a Congress um, without having to be there in person. There literally can be no committee work and no work on the floor, which is everything. 
um, unless people are there in person. So that's obviously one thing we need to need to change going forward. Mm -hmm. No, it's interesting. I, so in, in, in talking about sort of the way this is impacting your district, what you see every single day from your when what you hear from your constituents, your if you did or do, maybe even start by describing your district, it's it's essentially Hudson Valley. Is that right? Um, yeah. 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 Uh, if you think so for folks who aren't familiar with you, I mean, if you've been on the George Washington Bridge uh, going into New York City or, or past New York City and you looked up the river away from the city, my district starts about 25 miles up the river. So I have northeastern Westchester, all of Putnam and uh, Orange counties uh, on the west side of the river, uh, Orange <laughs> County and Southern Dutchess. So it's really West Point, the Hudson Highlands. Think of like Franklin Roosevelt's part of the Hudson River. And, and so what we've what we've seen, uh, obviously, New York being the real the global epicenter of this crisis of the of COVID-19 right now um, and and just doing some research before we had this conversation and looking at the numbers and in, in your district and in in, at least in the counties that you represent, uh, the numbers are still in the thousands. Um, That's right. And so I am I, I'm curious as to what you're hearing. What what are you hearing from? We hear a lot about the city, of course, um, and the crisis in the city. But how is that impacting even some of the more rural communities that you represent? How are some of those local hospitals dealing uh, with what I imagine is a, is an influx of patients? Do, do we have the PPEs? Do we have the testing? All the all the personal protective equipment when I say PPE, uh, how are communities like yours uh, faring um, these days? You know, we are not in the center of the storm, but we are right next to it. So um, when you live in my district, you know, you know someone who works in the city, you may work in the city. There's a lot of people who commute. Uh, I also represent a lot of rural communities where people are are staying staying here to work and, and go to school and, and to and to and to worship. And and and, and so I, it's a mix of sort of a commuter district, but also rural agricultural district, especially in Orange County. Represent about 25% military veterans, you know, at you know, the United States Military Academy is in my district. Um, so I would say for those who are normally going back and forth to the city, um, you know, it is a very, very stark change. We have about 13,000 cases uh, in the four counties um, that I represent in whole or in part. Um, so, you know, out of New York, I think the number today is about 92,000 cases in New York State. So obviously we have a significant caseload. Most of that is in Westchester and just a little bit south of where uh, where my district stops. But you know these are our neighbors. In, in terms of Orange and Putnam and Dutchess counties, we are seeing the numbers um, increase, but but by about somewhere between eight percent and twenty percent a day. Now that's a lot, and we're now uh, in the thousands. But 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 you can probably with our healthcare system sustain an eight percent increase. Um, when you start talking about 20 percent or, or higher on a daily basis, you know, you are really going to hit the wall pretty quick when you're talking about a limited number of ICU beds and ventilators and the rest. Yeah. So one thing we do every single day is we check in with all of the care providers, everyone who's seeing a patient with COVID-19 um, and, and even all the testing centers and anybody who's interacting with people um, just around testing or treatment. And and we make sure um, that they've got everything they need now. Everybody does, thank God, right now. But every every healthcare provider that I represent is looking at their 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 storage closet and their stockpile and saying, I don't know if this is enough. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, dealing with the governor and when you hear him, I'm sure he's on TV right now doing it in his daily press conference. You know, Governor Cuomo has been extraordinary. I think people realize that. Um, but you know, when he's when he is pushing and arguing for bringing some sense to this PPE situation, having the federal government take control of it and in the in the in the purchase and distribution of it, um, where it's going to show up is when my hospitals don't have enough. Yeah, I, I absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about what you just said, which is the federal government response. I, you know, I, I for one was shocked when I when I was uh, well, I don't necessarily watch the briefings anymore, but in hearing that uh, um, Trump and the, the coronavirus task force go on stage a couple of days ago and say that we will, a, a good, a positive scenario for the United States is losing between 100,000 and 240,000 uh, lives, uh, which is just tragic in every way. Um, so I'd love to talk about sort of, there's there's been a lot of conversation about um, it was the Trump administration asleep at the wheel. Um, I know there were some, some high profile things, et cetera, 
uh, in in time as as recent as as long ago as January as January and certainly early February. Uh, I know some congressional leaders were were briefed on the severity of what was to come. Um, and then, of course, the United States was not really responding uh, aggressively, at least at the federal level, uh, until a month or so later. Uh, can you speak about generally the federal the federal government, meaning the Trump administration's response to coronavirus broadly? Um, what's your sense of that is uh, at this point? Yeah, it's it. It could have been a lot better. Um, the fact is, is that those of us who are in the Congress, I serve on the House Intelligence Committee you know, get the information uh, that you need to make these decisions uh, in time, the president uh, even more so. But of course, anybody reading the New York Times or following the situation in Wuhan could have seen this coming. So I look, the president uh, early on did enact a travel ban uh, from China. That was an important step. But in terms of the preparation for the diagnostics, a national system of testing, having the materials available to do that, um, that was a huge missed opportunity to early on test and, and contact trace and contain the spread of this virus. The way, by the way, the administration you work for, the Obama administration did with such success during the Ebola crisis. I mean, the mm -hmm. Ebola crisis is the gold standard for how to respond to an infectious disease outbreak that could, could have become as serious as what we're dealing with now. Because, of course, Ebola is even more lethal um, if you contract it. And so on the diag uh, diagnostics, it was a terrible failure. Mm -hmm. um, but then even more so right now, the failure of the federal government to put under a single person all of the acquisition and distribution of, of personal protective equipment and critical equipment like ventilators is going to cost lives because the states are involved in this land grab sort of eBay bidding contest to try to find what's out there. The price is being bid way up. People are profit uh, taking on this. It's nuts. And states that are wealthier or that are hit sooner will have an advantage, I suppose. So weirdly, New York in the end may end up doing as, as, as well as any state, but it's a terrible way to do it. And so they've made a mess of that system. And then of course, more broadly, the president has just been happy talking this and downplaying it for weeks. Now, he's come around more recently because hundreds of thousands of Americans have now contracted the virus. But what we need, Rufus, is we need an after action commission on par with the 9-11 commission or the Warren commission. It should be bipartisan and bicameral. We should as much as possible keep the politics out of it because we really do need to learn from this. We really need to go back to the kind of attention and focus that the Obama administration had with a pandemic emergency uh, capability on the National Security Council. We ought to have a strategic stockpile that has enough ventilators for this scenario. It's actually a fraction, a fraction of the cost of what we're sp uh, spending now because we didn't get on top of it uh, in time. And so those are good investments um, so that we can handle a situation like this. But more importantly, we should be building international structures so that we can learn more quickly. Uh, the World Health Organization has real good expertise and learning on this in terms of data reporting and coordinating international response. I mean, there's so much we need to do. Um, and, and so I hope that we can do that in time and really dig into the lessons here so that this never happens again. Absolutely. Now, it, it's such an interesting, you mentioned Ebola, and I was ambassador during the Ebola crisis. And um, the way that the Obama administration en engaged all of our partner, every embassy around the uh, around uh, every American embassy around the world to engage our host governments and make sure that everybody was doing their part in helping contain Ebola. Um, it's uh, in the, when you talk about that, uh, that 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 international response, uh, it, 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 it was it was significant back then. Uh, we have so many questions which is a wonderful thing. Uh, before we get to them, I just want to talk about the CARES Act. I want to talk about the spending bill um, because I know a lot of people have questions about it. I, I, was, looking, um, I, I was looking at your Twitter feed uh, earlier today. It looked like the earliest checks are going to be going out on April 13th. Um, this is what multi-trillion dollar spending bill. Never seen anything quite like it before, at least in modern American history, right? Can you just talk a little bit about how this all came together um, and what I think the average American should should expect? What's uh, uh, who's getting who's going to get a little bit of money? Who's not going to get a little bit of money? Just so we uh, there's lots of I think misinformation out there about it as well. Yeah, you bet. And and I know there's a lot of anticipation, even though it was a, it's only one week tomorrow that this legislation was passed. But here's here's the deal. This is the third major major legislative package produced by the Congress, signed by the president. 
The first two had to deal with surging billions of dollars towards testing, uh, towards the development of a vaccine, pro providing things like paid family leave for the first time for millions of American workers, and those were very important. But this package dwarfs anything that's been done in American history. You're right, it's, it's, it's more than $2 trillion. And, and there's a couple of tangent points for most people that really matter. The first is that starting April 13th, the Treasury Department will pump out through direct deposit 60 million uh, checks um, electronically to about 60 million Americans and that will be the $1,200 per individual, $2,400 per couple, more if you have children. For folks making 150 as a couple or 75 as an individual or less, I believe there's some step down for people making slightly more than that. But by and large, that is the, the primary thing that's going to happen immediately. Um, in, in addition to the 60 million direct deposit actions, Starting about May 4th, uh, the Treasury Department will start sending 5 million checks every week. That's as many as they can do uh, to, to everybody else. And so for folks who don't use direct deposit currently, this is for your tax refund. Um, you should sign up for that now because you will, you, will, you will benefit from that in terms of getting those funds sooner. There will also be a portal and other opportunities to go on to the Treasury Department or IRS websites and to and to make sure you're included if for some reason you fall between the cracks. But all of us are pushing to have this happen as fast as possible. The other thing that's absolutely critical are the unemployment uh, benefits that are now going to be bigger and more comprehensive. More people are going to benefit from this than ever before. So a lot of folks have said to me, oh, I don't qualify for unemployment insurance. You have to check this out anyway, because now freelancers and independent contractors and sole proprietors will be covered in a way that they would not be covered under normal unemployment insurance. So that means you need to go to your state Department of Labor website. If you're in New York, it's labor.ny.gov. And, and when you see this morning that 6 million Americans have filed for unemployment in the last week, um, that is an eye-popping, heart-stopping number. But it's really important because what it means is those Americans are going to rapidly benefit from the unemployment insurance that is contained in this package. It's expanded. Here's what I mean. If your normal benefit uh, was X, this is going to be X plus $600 every week during the Great Recession. Um, at, you know, at the end of the Bush administration, early Obama administration, we increased unemployment benefits by $25 a week. These benefits are being increased First of all, you get the maximum amount, but then that is being increased by $600 a week. And it covers millions more people than would normally be covered. So those two things, the, the checks to individuals and families, the unemployment insurance, which will, will which will pick up millions and millions of people are critical. And, and I know I'm going on and on, but this, this stuff oh. matters. The, the third point, which is really so important to so many people, is the small business protection. So, so many people, you know, who have small businesses, running a restaurant, running a running a car dealership, running a lawn care business. You know, uh, these folks are so worried right now. So if you are in that position, bear in mind that the Small Business Administration is where you want to go. Now, you can go to your member of Congress like me. We'll help you through this. My my website for those people who I represent um, is a is a clearinghouse for all this information. Um, Shamaloney.house.gov. And it'll help. You'll find all the links and the toll-free numbers. You know, if you're a senior person, if you're if you're a small business owner, if you're an individual. But the point is, is that if you're a small business owner, the Small Business Administration—that's a federal agency, SBA—you'll hear people call it. That's the organization that should have put out guidance already on their website, and will have a process for you to sign up. And they will be working with thousands, tens of thousands of local and community banks um, that will know about these loans. But but here's the key: they aren't they aren't really loans. They're actually so that if you keep your employees and you can you can rehire ones you've let go, then they will be forgivable. So they'll be effectively grants to small businesses. So between the grants to small business, the uninsured payments and the direct payments, um, this bill has a really critical safety net for the tens of millions of Americans who are right now really worried. And, and there's a lot more in this bill for, for yeah. hospitals, for veterans, for transportation systems. I could go on and on. But those, I think, are the three most important things for individuals. It's so and it, but it's so interesting, um, Sean, because everything it, 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 it is it's an unprecedented bill. Um, and you mentioned this at the beginning of our conversation, too. Um, there is also the sense that it might not be enough. Right. That uh, Governor Cuomo um, has said did. People lose me. Sean, can you hear me? Damn. Oh, shit. 
Um, can so uh, maybe people can hear me. I, I can't hear anyone. Uh, then I can't hear Sean right now. But I will ask my question, and maybe everyone can hear me. Uh, the and maybe this will the the camera will come back. Um, but uh, Governor Cuomo has said that even this bill, as large and as, as robust as it, as it is, is not going to be enough. Um, and you mentioned that we are going to have to do subsequent bills uh, in the future. Um, it, oh, shoot. So, guys, I'm so sorry. It does seem that the congressman has lost his Internet connection. Uh, give us one second while we try to um, try to sh troubleshoot. Um, uh, give us one second and um, we'll pause for a moment. I'm sorry about this. And thank you all so much for the wonderful questions. Um, we just need to thank, thank you all for saying that you can still hear me. Um, yeah, so let me, so just for, first of all, while, while we're waiting for Sean to get back on the line, I, I do see some of your questions um, and, and we'll, he will be, he's better suited than I am to, to answer some of these. But when do you think, um, when do you think United, the, New York will, will reopen and workers able to return to their offices and workplaces? Uh, it, it's, uh, so we'll, we'll get his perspective on this. Um, it's the CDC is now reviewing, if not actually changing its guidance around recommending all of us to wear masks if we need to venture out. Uh, with this change now being actively debated, are we in a position to handle the new demand? Uh, will masks be available if this is now the recommendation? Um, uh, would it have benefited the country to all, 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 all be shut down at once? And the, the, um, the sad part is I have my own my own opinions on all of this, uh, but he, but uh, uh, the congressman will be much much better suited to answer them uh, than I will. Uh, so give us get, just give me one second. Let me see him. Um, let let me see if we can just get him back on, uh, and then we can continue the conversation. Just give us a pause for one moment. Thank you so much. And we are told that it is the internet on his end uh, that uh, that just cut out for a moment. But I, I would imagine we'll be able to get this figured out in just a moment. We're we're on the line with with his folks. Thank you, and thanks for your patience. <laughs> a very nice question that, that that just came out while we're waiting. Can you tell us about uh, the painting behind behind me? <laughs> that is, I, I actually, it's a, I am, I am currently living um, at, at my parents' house. So this is this is actually a painting that they they have had for a, a number of years. So it's a, uh, uh, like many of us, we've had to um, adjust during this. Uh, a very very crazy and difficult time and um we had uh planned some construction at our house so um we have no longer had we do not have a kitchen so we've had to relocate to my parents house and so that's a that's a that's a that's where that's where we are 
And now someone is asking us about the, now someone is asking me about the lamp behind me. <laughs> the lamp is actually something um, I think from a trip to the Caribbean. Um, uh, uh, for, uh, my brother-in-law collected shells and and gave it as a gift to my to my parents. <laughs> But um, I, I thanks uh, thanks so much to all of you for your patience. It's uh, uh, and uh, remarkably, I think um, the vast majority of people have stayed on the call. And look, I, I will just say this: I, I am a veteran of the Obama administration. I was I worked on both Obama campaigns. Um, I was the U.S. ambassador to Denmark for four years in the second term of Obama, and we did see some of these unprecedented. I mean, look, nothing compares to coronavirus. We know that. Um, but we did see an unprecedented um, health event with when Ebola started to break out in West Africa. And it, we were tasked almost immediately to uh, to run a coordinated international response to the Ebola crisis. And that meant getting every partner country, including every EU country, including uh, the country that I was serving in, to step up and actual and and participate. Um, and they all did. And the, the fact of the matter is, we contained for the most part what could have been uh, what could have been an absolutely devastating epidemic. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. This is what happens in the era of Zoom and all the rest. <laughs> Give us one second. We got to get Sean back on. Give us one second. I am told that he should be back on in one second. <laughs> I am just going to try to call him and uh, put him on speakerphone so you all can hopefully hear his responses through my, through the computer. Um, might be just the best solution we have at the moment. So what what have you just asked actually something that I that I feel very qualified to answer is uh, uh, are you following how Denmark is responding to this crisis apparently the government is paying employers to keep employees so they can be ready to work as soon as as soon as the crisis is over um, this sounds more logical than what we're doing I, I do think that it's um, the the response that some of the Scandinavian countries are in particular and this has been if, if you're following this and the New York Times and 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 various publications um, they they have spoken about how the government stepped in early and very very aggressively to not only protect the public health interests of the community uh but also the um the uh, the the economic interests of not just the people but also the small businesses uh generally speaking uh it is they are they it is a different system than the united states um there's no doubt of doubt about it hold on one second Hey, Sean. Hey, total power <laughs> failure at the house. So I'm attempting to log back on through the hotspot on my phone, but it, uh, the signal's not strong enough. So nope. so, it may work, it may not. Hey, well, so I, I have you on speakerphone right now if we can continue the conversation because I think people can actually hear you if that works. Yeah, you bet. Uh, I apologize. We lost all power. So Good. So, but, no. uh, yeah, by all means. And I can, I can see the screen so I can see some of the questions, but okay. go ahead. Okay, great. So let's let's start it. Let's start um, by by uh, going to some of the um, uh, 
and I assume you can hear the congressman now, everybody. So uh, let's um, let's uh, let, let's start by going to some of those questions. So uh, when do you think New York will reopen and workers able to return to their offices and workplaces? I think you're looking at at least another month. And, and even then, uh, that may be optimistic. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I do think this is going to be at least a month of um, the situation we find ourselves in now, and then I think you will see a state to normal life where some people will be allowed to go back to work, where the number of um, you know businesses that are allowed to open will increase, where restaurants may be reopened but with a fraction of the seating capacity to allow for distancing, that kind of thing. Um, obviously, it's sped up if we had better therapies and a vaccine. Uh, or even uh, antibody tests so we can know who has it and who's uh, now developed an immunity. Uh, and those things are unknowable. But I think we're looking at probably a month to six weeks minimum. Got it. Yeah. Um, and we'll just roll through some of these, actually, because we have a lot of great a lot of great questions. How are uh, how, how should we be thinking about supporting communities of color and the LGBTQI plus folks during this pandemic? Right. Well, you know, the most important things that we did in the love bill will, will center around an expansion of uh, Medicaid, for example, that is such a lifeline for so many people to allow them to have access to health care. Uh, in addition to that, we, we put in more than a billion dollars to support community health centers. Uh, that's where a lot of low income families uh, get their health care. It's where, by the way, people who are undocumented often go uh, to get health care. Um, so some of the most vulnerable and marginalized folks in our society, um, and because LGBTQ people are often um, more likely to be marginalized, um, Medicaid and community health centers are critically important. We're also waiving a lot of the uh, co-pays and cost sharing that would normally apply um, so I think those will be some of the most important areas. Great. Yeah. Um, so some of the th questions that I get, even just personally all the time, just curious as to your perspective on this. So the CDC is now reviewing, it, it, I, so much of it has to go to not asymptomatic transmission. Um, it, we were told for a long time, it, you don't wear a mask unless you're sick. Now I think some of the guidance has changed. What, what are, are you hearing anything on this? Um, should, should are you, do, would you encourage uh, from what you hear, do, would you encourage people who who feel healthy when they go outside to be wearing masks? Um, and frankly, are there enough of them to go around? I think the answer to that is no. Excuse me, hold on. I think I might be back. Okay. Well, I can I can see you at least, but I, I think you can't see me. This the feedback is pretty bad, yeah. Stand by. Yes, much better. Yes. Okay, great. Hey, so sorry about that, but at least I can see your beautiful face. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry about that. Well, <laughs> we are officially we winging it. Yeah. <laughs> Just a mask, mask protocol. Should healthy people uh, be wearing yeah. masks? Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think that's a tough question. I, I think there's clearly no downside, right, to wearing a mask unless it makes you touch your face more and you end up, you know, coming in contact with the virus because you're fiddling with your mask and that involves your nose and your mouth. I think that's been some of the concern expressed that when, when you're talking about healthy people wearing masks. But, of course, um, I think that that for most people, sounds like kind of silly advice. Uh, I, I think a more serious issue would be whether if you create a run on masks, you're going to be depriving um, people who are on the front lines, healthcare workers and others, from having access to the kind of equipment they need because they're really in harm's way. And so to the extent that you're social distancing and you're staying at home, you know, I don't think, I'm not wearing a mask when I go out in public. I'm not worried that my family... Um, what, what I am worried about is that my kids stay home, that I go do the shopping, that I'm very careful about what I what I do in terms of uh, any kind of surface contact, that I wash my hands obsessively or use, you know, um, Purell or hand sanitizer. And that when I bring products into the house, I wipe them down because, of course, someone put that on the shelf. Someone was touching it and looking at it before me, often in a supermarket. Um, 
I think those steps are actually very practical, very important. We do not have any contact outside the the people I mentioned earlier, my kids. There's a young man staying with us, and there's there's a neighbor who is essentially lives on my property, and we're sharing meals and hanging out with him. So there's about six of us, and about two of us go out and kind of contact outside that. That's, to me, where you're really going to protect yourself and your family. Now, you have to be able to work remotely. If you can't do that, if you have to go to work, uh, then I think, you know, taking those kinds of steps around of wearing a mask may make more sense. You know, if you're, a, if you're, a, if you're in a grocery store and you have to uh, encounter people all day long, I would be more concerned. But, but I think what we have found from CDC is that it's really the people who may have the virus who need to be wearing a mask so that they do not spread through respiratory droplets uh, the virus beyond their own bodies. And mm. it's more important for those people who may be uh, carrying the virus to have masks. Sure. Um, and we'll just run through some of them because there are a lot of great questions out there. So, um, so it, actually, this this is helpful. Is, is there some sort of clearinghouse a website where so so much of the stuff that you just went through verbally, as far as the um, the impacts of the CARES Act, is there a is there a website where people can go to get this information at their fingertips? CDC has a good website. There are other websites website. that I think. Hey, oh look, you? there you are! <laughs> Yay! Hold on. <laughs> All right, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? yeah, we can. We oh, can, look can at that! Now, so we're still working off. A, we're working off a hot spot here, and uh, so bizarrely, the power went off at the house. I hope it's nothing too serious. Um, but um, there are good websites. I think that basically, State Department of Health, the CDC, uh, those are good sites. I know for people I represent, we put everything on my website so that you can customize information you're looking for. So seniors, for example, you know, every county is going to have an office of the aging. Typically, they're going to have good information for you if you're shut at home and you you, you need somebody to help with food delivery, if you need um, uh, other types of services, a prescription fill, that kind of thing. So I would recommend, uh, depending on what your situation is, looking at your county for help. Um, people who are unemployed, State Department of Labor, small business owners, SBA website. Um, health information, yeah, CDC or your, your Department of Health at the county or state level um, should be telling you uh, the right stuff. And especially if, you, if you're reading junk online around therapies or that sort of thing, please know there are no proven therapies right now uh, for COVID-19. There's a lot of misinformation out there and it's understandable. There's, there's a huge amount of work being done to look at what are called repurposed therapies or repo therapies. That's existing medicines that have been approved to see whether they can help folks who are dealing with this virus, but nothing has proven effective yet and some stuff can hurt you. So, so there's a lot of misinformation out there too. And, and there's, by the way, one more thing, there's a lot of scams out there. So if you've got, um, seniors in your life in particular, if you're an elderly person yourself, no one is going to call you and ask for your social security number. No one is going to call you and ask for your bank account number. We legit um, be very careful. Sadly, there's a bunch of people trying to take advantage of people right now around the payments and around other services. Yeah. Um, Oh, no. OK, there you are again. OK, so there are a couple of questions. If you can still hear me, Sean, there are a couple of questions, I think, very much concerning the the unemployment claims this morning, 6.6 .6 million, which is a massive number that I think uh, even the most dire predictions didn't anticipate. Um, so as, as far as Congress is concerned, of course, this is news this morning. Um, are there plans being made for uh, just this, what, what is, of course, an unprecedented, not just health, public health crisis, but also what we anticipate being an economic crisis as well um, with, inf you know, with a mass influx into unemployment websites but, uh, across the board. Um, if, is, will there be financial assistance, uh, thoughts about financial assistance for healthcare workers, first responders, et cetera? What's your, what's your thinking on all of that? I think we should be paying effectively hazard pay to healthcare workers. Um, they should be getting paid more, especially if they are at um, facilities that are dealing with large number of patients. I can tell you, I have heard the stories. Maybe you've seen it on on TV, but I've heard from constituents who are working, you know, twelve hour shifts, um, you know, day after day after day, and they are really in danger of burning out. And as we reach the apex of cases here in New York. We really need help. You've seen the governor put out a call for people to come to New York who are healthcare workers. Um, so I think the least we could do is, would be to compensate them more. Um, I'd like to propose a tax credit for folks who've been working 
um, in, in, in certain professions where there are a certain number of cases, you could see, for example, a five or $10,000 tax credit on next year's return or this year's return so that those workers are, so that all of us can share um, in the burden and thank those people properly. I think there's some good ideas out there. We should, we should do it in the next package. Cool. That's great. Um, so you know, a couple, just a couple more questions that, that I have as well. So I, um, look, it's, it's a political season. I think we can't forget the fact that it's a, that it's, that's an election year. I, as, as we were having this conversation, I, I came across my feed that the democratic national committee or the De democratic convention is at least pushing till August. It looks like moving a month. Um, how do we run? I mean, you've endorsed Joe Biden. I've endorsed Joe Biden. I, I, I um, how do we think about a presidential campaign in the midst of this crisis? Um, uh, is is it time for politics? I, I of course my my phone blows up as being asked for political contributions. It was March the end of a quarter, just a couple of days ago. How do we think about politics at a time like this? Can we be running campaigns at the same time we're dealing with this public health crisis? Well, first of all, Rufus, I didn't know you were you were still giving donations. So you know, I have a <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. But, but the fact fair is, is that, no, I'm kidding. But, but the fact is, is that um, I think it's more important than ever that to be engaged in politics right now. I think we use politics as a pejorative, right? Oh, it's political. You're engaged in politics. The fact is, is that politics is how a free civil society, you know, engages in debate, makes needed change without killing one another. The alternative is armed violence, right? And so the fact is, is that one of the silver linings of the Trump era has been this enormous level of engagement, particularly by young people. I mean, look at the Me Too movement, look at the Sunrise movement, look at the Dreamers, look at the Parkland kids. Um, and I say all the time, we'd be a better country if we had more high school kids in Congress. The fact is, is that this engagement is more important than ever because so much of what we're dealing with right now is because the leadership at the federal level is terrible and we need to make a change. So, um, look, yeah, I, I was with Biden, you know, before Iowa, there were some dark days there. I'm glad he's <laughs> I hear you. because I, I have to tell you, uh, I think the vice president has has a almost unique opportunity to be the leader we need at this time. Experienced, steady, decent. He can not only win this election and bring that kind of leadership in a crisis like this that we need, but he can also repair the damage not just to our federal government and to the agencies that have been so damaged by the Trump administration, but he can also drain some of the poison out of our politics because every every fiber of Joe Biden's being, I think, you know, kind of tends towards reconciliation and healing and building building outward by 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 reaching out to other human beings and seeing the best in them. And if there's any silver lining about this horrible crisis that we're dealing with. It is that it has given us all a common enemy. It has given us all a common purpose. And, and it is about things that are much more important than our partisan affiliation or some of the debates we've had in recent years. We are literally, truly all fighting this together, in this together. And, and I think that Biden has a unique opportunity to be a less polarizing leader, regardless of your politics. If you're a progressive Democrat who's sorry Bernie didn't win, if you're a conservative Republican who wants to see a Republican win, Regardless of that, it, when Joe Biden becomes president in a few months, he can, I think, better than anybody on the national stage right now, reach out in a way that we have not seen for far too long. Yeah, you're here. I agree with you 100 percent. One quick question on this. You know, I think there's a huge move on the Dem in the Democratic Party towards uh, vote by mail. Um, do you anticipate and, and that's been part of some some of the various packages uh, or should we be going to polling places? And do you think we have to prepare to be voting by mail as a nationally as a country uh, in November? Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. And it, it's something we fought very hard for in the last COVID package. But there was so much stuff in there that couldn't wait. Uh, we have put it we have put it uh, to one side, but we are not forgetting about it. Every state should be planning vote by mail right now. And and I'm really worried about this, uh, Rufus, because, um, you know, there's few things except maybe martial law that give a president more power than a national health emergency. Um, I hear this a lot from my progressive friends. They're really worried about the power Donald Trump has. And by the way, they are doing things under the guise of this emergency around immigration and at the border. That, that are not getting enough attention because, because there's, there's just such sweeping authority given and discretion given 
um, and necessarily so in many ways because we're dealing with a healthcare emergency. So it's more important than ever that we watch like a hawk um, the free conduct of this election, that we guard against foreign influence and malign efforts to spread disinformation and vision right now online, the way we've seen in the past from the Russians and others. Um, and we must proceed on schedule. Those of us who lived through 9-11 in New York um, have some familiarity with this. There was some talk then about whether New York could have an election. Um, that year was a mayoral election year in 2001. And we went forward with those um, with those elections. And it was very important that we do so. Now, it's harder now because you can't gather. And the campaign may look a little differently. You point out the convention's been kicked to August. That's fine. Look, I'd be fine if we did the conventions remotely. I'd be fine if we did a lot of this stuff uh, differently in terms of rallies and the rest. But we must vote. And there are ways to do it. We can do it with no excuse absentee voting. We can do it with vote by mail. Um, we can we can extend the hours and have more early voting if people have to show up in person. But there are ways to do this, and we must. Great, thank you. Um, and last question, Congressman. Uh, I, so I, I'm going to give you a, I, I'm going to give you what I think is sort of the biggest layup question that Peter Alexander asked Donald Trump a couple of weeks ago, and he couldn't answer. And that is, you know, w w I think you, there are a lot there are a lot of Americans that are scared out there. There are a lot of Americans who've lost faith and trust in institutions and um, and doubts about doubts about their government, whether it's federal, state, local, whatever. Um, what do you say to the millions of Americans out there who are genuinely scared? Um, I count myself and and my family members as as uh, Americans who who are legitimately scared about what uh, what the future looks like, not just for me and my health, but also the economic future of the country, et cetera. What do you say to them? Well, what I say is that that I understand that. I think we're all scared and and we are all uh, we are all being called on to act and to be courageous despite our fear. Uh, but fear is totally normal right now because it's very scary stuff. And none of us has really lived through anything like this before. But I'm absolutely certain we will get through it. And I do think in, in this in this in this regard, maybe LGBTQ people have something to offer because, of course, those of us who are old enough to remember the the horror of the AIDS epidemic know what it was like to be feeling abandoned, to be feeling left aside by the government as we watched our friends and 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 family members uh, die. Um, I think those of us who are LGBTQ have had to had to deal with institutions failing us, have had to deal with figuring out how to build community when it seemed like we couldn't count on anybody. And we've had to deal with fear. We've had to deal with the fear of being rejected, of, 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 of being shunned just because we were going to live honestly as who we are. And we have an experience crossing lines of difference because we've had to. We've had to kind of find a way to be in relationship with people even when maybe just a few months or years earlier, they wanted nothing to do with us. And we built those bridges anyways, because we, we believe that it's better to let people back into relationship with us, even when they've hurt us, as long as, as we can have integrity and, 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 and expect respect from others. And so I think when we face situations like this, it, weirdly, there is an opportunity to build community because when you think about privilege in our society, when you think about what wealthy people or, or white people or, or straight people uh, come to expect, this is stripping a lot of privilege away from people. You know, I've, I've been talking about this with my husband. It's, it's, it's weird because it's, it's the first time I think in, I can remember where even my very wealthy, cocooned, protected friends uh, and supporters are genuinely feeling like their lives have been impacted just like everybody else's. They can't go to work. They can't do their business. They've seen their own personal fortunes put at risk or, or really threatened. They understand that their family members can get it. They can't buy their way out of it. There's nowhere they can go. They can't hop on a plane and go to some resort and be protected. Uh, they are very much uh, feeling vulnerable. Now, they are not, in fact, as vulnerable as people who are homeless or people who are uh, don't have the luxury of social distancing because they don't have you know a place that's big enough for their family. So it's always going to be better off to be wealthy, I suppose, in our country, in our world. But I have to tell you, I do think there is a level of vulnerability that is new um, and that is that is more pervasive and further reaching than I've ever seen before. And in that, there is an opportunity to find common shared humanity again across all our lines of difference. And I really hope that 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 we have the kind of political leadership that knows how to speak to that, because it will be an opportunity to bring us together. And we need that. And I do think LGBTQ people have something to offer in this conversation because we've been on that journey before. 
um, and we know we know that you can get through it. And so I think even in our fear, we know that there is a day coming when we will look back on this and say, um, you know, we survived it. Yes, sir. Well, we'll let that be the last word. Um, Sean, uh, Congressman Ohlone, Sean, my friend, thank you so much uh, for spending uh, some time with us at the Out Leadership this week and Leadership this year. Thank you uh, this week. Thank you so, so much. Uh, hope your power gets back on, by the way. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it's not a long black out there. So, uh, Well, thank that- you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for all you do. Uh, we you, need sir. you. You are you are such a um, such an important leader in our community. We're so proud of what you did in Denmark. I have been there. I know you have the biggest fan club in the world. When anybody who has not been to Denmark, go and say you know Rufus Gibbard, and you will not pay for your drinks. You will be you will be welcomed everywhere. And, uh, so we're looking we're looking forward to to all the contributions you're going to make um, and have made. So thanks for what thank you do. Thank you. Thank thanks to everybody out there for and stay safe. Stay safe and healthy, everybody. Thank you all so, so much. Uh, And we'll see you again. uh, We'll see you again next week.